This is the story of a man who died long before I was born. A man of many trades. A military man. A father. A sailor. A vagabond. A poet. This is the story of my great-grandfather, Philip J. Steger Sr. China C. Phil. Philip Jacqueline Steger was born on April 2, 1918, to mother Anna Magruder Steger Jenkins and father Francis Joseph Steger in Washington, D.C. His father was a wealthy lawyer, while his mother came from old money, a descendant of Confederate General John Bankhead Magruder. Phil spent his early childhood with his mother and father in their large estate with maids, servants, and all the typical signs of wealth in the early 1900s. This didn't last long, as he was soon sent away to boarding school, his mother and father divorcing not long after. At age 13 in 1931, he ran away from his boarding school and traveled the country alone. He told stories of riding freight trains, working as a harvest hand, gandy dancing as a street peddler and panning for gold in Montana and Idaho, although his actual whereabouts during this time are unknown. It was 1938 when he was first acquainted with the sea, sailing out of Baltimore, Maryland at 20 years old. He sailed on various oil tankers and cargo ships until joining the Canadian Air Force at the outbreak of World War II, sometime between 1940 and 41. It was 1941 at a dance in Toronto where he met his future wife, Joan Kathleen Broad Ottawell, but we just call her Nanny. As the story goes, he was in the Canadian Army then, or Air Force, and stationed in Toronto. And there was a dance that they used to have for all the uh, army officers and so forth. Nanny used to go. Nanny at that time was very shy and Nanny was a good girl. She didn't take chances. She did not venture any place where she shouldn't be. But she would go to these dances. And Phil Sr., when he saw her, he went up to her and he said, Come on, Joni, let's dance. They were married later that year, but not without the opposition of Nanny's parents. Her father was an imposing man, an influential attorney like Phil's father, as well as a Canadian Army officer during the First World War. Phil Sr. was not intimidated or afraid of her father. And that undoubtedly impressed her. October 7th, 1942 saw the birth of my grandfather, Philip J. Steger, Jr. The family of three lived in Toronto until mid-1943, when they relocated to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where Phil Sr. was working as a mechanic at the Willow Run Aircraft Plant. Nanny describes the situation in a series of letters to Phil's father, Frank. October 23rd, 1943. Phil works seven days a week. I'm so proud of him, the way he manages our affairs, etc. As long as we three can remain together, everything will be to my liking. One should not worry about missing out on a few good times these days. Though he never finished high school, Phil began taking college classes alongside his wife. She was going for a bachelor's in teaching, while he was taking refrigeration classes in addition to working. June 7th, 1944. He's been so very busy working Sundays and holidays, and with his classes after work on Tuesday and Friday. When Phil comes up, we'll go dancing at the Royal York Roof Gardens, etc., and make believe it's 1941. We met on July 12th, you see, at a dance. With the end of the war rapidly approaching, Phil was laid off by the aircraft plant, and he began traveling in search of work, leaving his family for long periods of time. Nanny soon became the main breadwinner of the family. Phil would hold various jobs throughout the late 40s and early 50s, including working on oil pipelines and railroads, test driving cars for GM, and even working on the Atlas and Titan II intercontinental ballistic missiles. Phil Sr. at that time was able to hold, as I said, any kind of a job. But if there was a problem, he would make up some excuse and he would leave and he would not have any problem with getting a job. 
Traveling the country without a steady job began to take a toll on the family, as Phil Jr. grew up mostly without a father. As he grew closer to his mother, Phil Sr. became more distant, becoming an intimidating presence in Phil Jr.'s life. There was nothing that um, he wouldn't do for his son, but in a backhanded way. There was always negativity, kind of um, in the same token as doing something positive for him. It was one of those yes but type things. He did love Phil's mother, but she realized again at a, year, a very early marriage, and after my husband was born, that the marriage was not gonna work. And so she prepared for divorce. Phil and I, we had gone together five years, and we were finally going to be getting married. And when my husband was 21 years old, she told him that she was divorcing him. And my husband said, it's about time. Phil Sr. was devastated, and his relationship with his son deteriorated further. After the divorce, he became a drifter and began building a small house for himself in Florida. His son was married in 1965, but he didn't attend the wedding. That year, he returned to the sea by joining the Merchant Marines. He spent the rest of the 60s traveling to Japan, Hawaii, the Philippines, and also running helicopters and troops to Vietnam. It was on these journeys where he began writing poetry. His first book, Down to the Sea in Bumboats, is lost, but his second book, Strictly Scuttlebutt, was published in 1969. By that time, he had left the Merchant Marines and returned to his drifting ways, selling his books to pay his way across the country. He also gave himself the nickname of China Sea Phil, which is what he preferred to be called. He grew out his beard, wore shaggy clothes, and fully committed to living the life of a grizzled old sailor. He would make his living by getting a temporary job while living in his house in Florida. After about six months, he would quit his job and make the drive out to San Francisco, where he had become a well-known street artist. He'd live in his van and sell his books until the money ran out. Then he would return to Florida, beginning the cycle again. He would also send his books to various people and institutions, including the U.S. Merchant Marines Academy, the Department of the Navy, the San Francisco Maritime Museum, and even the governor of Florida, Claude Kirk. His third book, Any Old Port, was published in 1971. He may have lived in Florida, but his heart was always in San Francisco. He had become a staple of the city, having various newspaper articles written about him. He was even interviewed by Jack Anderson on his radio show on K101 in 1975. This is the only recording of his voice known to exist. Well, we've gotten away from the tradition of hearing poetry read uh, out loud, and I'm going to try to uh, do what I think uh, is kind of a unique uh, thing for a radio broadcast these days, and that is to have a relaxed conversation with a man of the street. He is very unpretentious, and he doesn't call himself a poet. He's just interested in writing poetry. When did you first come to the Bay Area? Uh, 1932. I came in uh from uh, up in uh, Washington State, I was uh, riding uh, side door Pullmans up there in those days, uh -huh. 1932. Uh -huh. Side door Pullmans. We used to call them, uh, that's a boxcar, Jack, for you young whippersnappers. Uh -huh. What's been the reaction of the public to a, uh, a street artist who uh, says, wait a minute, I'm not going to uh, try to sell you a leather belt or some Indian jewelry, but I want you to, uh, to examine my ideas through poetry? What happens? It's kind of like, uh, I would imagine, having leprosy, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, there's a classic myth about seamen and their women. I've, I've often wondered how many, uh, how many mariners can really stay married. Uh, uh, very few, very few. Uh, it takes a, a particular type of person uh, to be able to do that, just like it takes a particular person to be able to go to sea. I think that, um, it, in fact, it takes a particular person to be able to, st to be enjoyed, uh, to enjoy being married in the first place. Let's see, now I've got one here called Lonesome Town. I often run around knocking country music, but um, I kind of like some of it, you know, especially my own. I, you know, everybody has to be a ham. And uh, I call it Song of Lonesome Town. 
I know how lonesome whistles sound a crying through the night. The dogs that bay up at the moon when things ain't going right. I've walked the streets of Lonesome Town, no place to lay my head, and looked at people loving and wished that I was dead. There ain't no trouble like the souls, the hurts of love's goodbye. Some people have to run away and twist and turn and die. Now, it ain't no easy feeling, and I hope you never know exactly how it feels, unless I tell it so. When you see a fellow human who's down upon his luck, you'll stand a whole lot taller as you bend and help him up. Do we have much time left, Jack? No, I have a couple I, of Christmas I, I, points. I, I, time's gone. I'll tell you, Phil, I'd like you to do the one about, um, about your experience with Christmas around, uh, around ships. Oh, yes. I've got one called I Remember Christmas Spent. <clears throat> it's Christmas time again. The decorations are going up. I haven't heard the carols yet, but they'll be there. Most of the fun of Christmas is in the giving, to have someone to give to. This year, there's no one for me. Now, that doesn't mean that loneliness is not around. It's just that some people never learn to accept. I remember Christmas spent in New Orleans at a riverbank shipyard on a ship. The only ones aboard were a few crew members on duty. We stood 12-hour watches back to back. The chief steward attached to each working crew member's door a card bearing a small striped candy cane and two typewritten words, Merry Christmas. You know, it kind of made our day, and all it cost was a little love. We've been talking with Philip J. Stroger, who has a very uh, imposing name, but is a very natural and an honest man who likes diversify and it's been a pleasure talking with you philip the books are on sale in the maritime museum in san francisco and uh, in the meantime phil you did give us some of your own uh, versifying about christmas about san francisco about ships and about women and we are appreciative of that uh, i hope that uh, i hope that there's a better place for the poet in this community I, I hope so. I think people people uh, seem to enjoy it if they can get something that they can get their teeth in. But it, you can't eat air, Jack. You can't eat air. And your poems <laughs> aren't air. They're uh, they're built out of some real hard stuff. They're built out of hard stuff. Maybe you break a tooth on them, but uh, <laughs> there's something there, anyhow. You know. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. I appreciate being here. Thanks, pal. After your mom after Beth was born. He showed up one day on our porch. I had no idea. He wound up staying with us for two weeks and he never acknowledged your mom. She was a baby. And that again hurt my Phil to think this is your granddaughter and you can't say how wonderful it is to see someone, you know, following in your line. And that bothered him. But he stayed with us for two weeks, and then he left again. And there was only one time that I remember my Phil kind of talking back to his dad. And his dad said, well, you can't blame me because I never had a father. And my Phil said, neither have I. Phil would visit his son and his grandchildren sporadically during his final years, with the young family visiting his Florida house on a few occasions. When we went down to Florida to, to see his dad, and my son uh, went, it was really funny, he went in the back door, went out the front door to the edge of the property, and he picked up a rock and he threw it in the water. And Phil Sr. came rushing out and said, don't throw my stuff in the water. They were rocks. And so <laughs> I, I remember Philip turning around, he must have been five or six or something like that. 
And he turned around and he looked and he thought, that's what you do with rocks. You throw them in the water. And I think that soured him on the whole trip. Mostly he would keep to himself, either at his Florida house or in San Francisco. He rarely, if ever, spoke to Nanny after the divorce. By this time, she had been remarried to a former Yugoslavian soldier and resistance fighter who had fled to America named Svetomir Tomic, or Steve for short. He had also become somewhat of a hoarder, his house filled with canned goods, scraps of paper, and all kinds of things he thought would be useful. Most of his time was spent writing to old friends and shipmates, selling his books, or performing in local plays in San Francisco. On New Year's Eve, 1980, Phil was sitting in his favorite chair with a cup of tea beside him, looking out the window at the canal flowing by as he drifted off to sleep. He did go back to the house in Florida when he died. And again, that's where the cousin had found him. And um, sitting in his chair, that um, you know, looking out the window at, at the water. So how long he had been dead, they think probably four or five days. Phil Sr. passed away in his sleep in the first hours of 1981. He was 62 years old. By the time Phil Jr. was notified, he was already cremated. It would be many years until Phil scattered his father's ashes in the Gulf of Mexico. Dear Mr. Steger, thank you for your thoughtful letter. I was deeply saddened by the passing of your father. He was a very talented man, but most important, he was a fine human being. I shall miss his friendship, as well as my husband Jack and our son Eddie. We enjoyed his visits to our home. His humor was a delight, and he was always good company. Sincerely, Florence Anderson. Phil Stager Jr. and family, thank you so very much for writing to us. Our hearts are very heavy with the loss of your father and our beloved friend. We loved him dearly, and he was truly a great man. Under the rough exterior beat a big, soft, and generous heart. We are very proud to have known him, and our memories of him will help us to stand our loss in God's game. My husband George worked with your father on the Atlas and Titan missiles. They had a great friendship. We have always kept in touch with him over the years. I had sent him a packet of coffee and tea and our Christmas card to him, and I received a letter from him on December 20th, 1980, saying how important our Christmas card was to him, and how friends were very important to him too and thanking me for the coffee and tea. He said he would have the coffee on Christmas Eve and the tea on New Year's Eve. When we heard he passed away on New Year's Eve, it really hit hard, especially knowing that maybe he had that cup of tea. God bless him. Our love and many thanks. Gloria, George Robbins, and family. Nanny and Steve would remain together until Steve's death in 2006. Nanny followed two years later. Phil Jr., my grandfather, would pass away in 2014 at the age of 72. Though they have left this earth, their stories will be remembered for generations to come, and it is to their memory that this film is dedicated. Taken from Strictly Scuttlebutt in potter's field, the crabgrass grows. There are no crosses run on rows. There is no stone to mark the sight of one who lived as we tonight. There's only one thing sure I know. No one's to grieve when I must go. No one's to bow their head or cry. I'm simply shoving off alone. Goodbye.
the seaman doth approach his love. I see her, San Francisco, there to the right she lies. We're steaming up from Dago, fresh from the Orient Eye. We'll be picking up the pilot from his boat with all the sail. She's the California, from Frisco town she hails. Soon it's past the lighthouse, then her golden gate. The bridge above and under, now I can hardly wait. Her bay unfolds before us. Ah, what a sight to see. My love, my San Francisco. Oh, darling, I love thee. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? <laughs> Phil, I can tell your heart's into that. How many you times know. have you come under the Golden Gate? Oh, Gate many times. I've been, I've been under it and over it and, uh, mm -hmm. and flown over it, coming back from the Far East, and man, it always looks good. And you love the city. I love the city. It's a beautiful place. 